All right, you guys. So today um, we're headed back to chapter five. But seemingly, at least at first, in a, in a completely different direction than we were before. Um, like I said, it's not that chapter five is all over the place. It's 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 really broad. It's um, it is one set of ideas. There's just so many components to it. And uh, if you tried to read it as just it's as a chapter, well, it uh, it can be a bit much. So I've split it down into, and I told you this week or so back before we took the uh, last lecture test, um, but I split it into three parts uh, for that very reason. And uh, this part uh, is, as this thing indicates, about evolution. The next one. Uh, takes this information and, and then sort of applies it, and it's all part of um, the first section of, of Chapter 5. <coughs> so it is all connected, it's just um, I felt it's better to tackle it as sort of individual subjects. Um, because arguably any one of these is, is a chapter in and of itself. Uh, this lecture will probably take two class periods, okay? Ideally. Um, and uh, we'll see where to go from, from there. And I know that some of the content from uh, 5.1 ended up on the first test. I think we might just, for continuity's sake, uh, ask some of those same questions <coughs> again um, on the second test, which you probably won't have an issue with. If you got them right, hopefully you'll get them right again. If you got them wrong, well, then you got to second chance at, at, at fixing it. Um, but again, just for continuity's sake, seeing all of Chapter 5 uh, together, uh, oftentimes it's not until you, you take those assessments that uh, you see the bigger picture. So, Anywho, without further ado, a um, little bit about evolution. So you've obviously heard this word before. A little bit in high school, as I understand it. And before that. And oh, they introduced it in middle school? Yeah. Or grade school? Or both? Well, I definitely remember it. I don't know about it. Well, yeah, they did. I don't know about it. All right. And you're a product of Utica School District? Yes, Utica Academy of Science. Oh, you went to Utica Academy of Science. All right. That that does, exp I don't want to say explain a little bit, but that is... I, with science in their name, I would think that they would talk a little bit more about it. Um, I had two kids in the Utica district myself, so I know more or less what they talked about, and I don't know about the other schools. The problem is, is, is um, like a lot of stuff we've already talked about this semester, it, it became politicized. Um, and... Um, and also, of course, there's the religious aspect to it as well. Um, so when, when we talk about this in here, I want you to keep in mind that we are in a science class. And if you, if you do happen to be in a position where you disagree with some of the stuff we're talking about, um, I, I certainly don't expect necessarily to change, change your minds, okay? Um, but you do when it comes time to, you know, for the, the test. Um, I want you to answer the questions as as if it were a science class, um, and you know if you want to get those questions right. Uh, so, so again, and I do welcome you know conversation. Please, you guys should know that well enough by now. But uh, if you have you know questions, comments, concerns, whatever about some of the stuff we're talking about, you know, feel, please do jump jump in. And you guys aren't that shy, so I'm not super worried. But all right, um, so uh, what is evolution? Um, evolution is accumulative genetic changes that occur over time in a population of organisms. Well, that doesn't sound so horribly threatening or scary, does it? Um, not rhetorical. Not rhetorical. So, um, cumulative genetic changes that occur, occur over time in a population of organisms. So we're going to be talking about things like a gene pool. All right, 
And I know you guys all did Punnett Squares at some point in your life, and Gregor Mendel and his pea plants and all that stuff. And um, so we're kind of in that vein, all right? And what we're saying is that as a population changes due to um, what we'll call deep differential reproductiveness, conjugated it weirdly at the end there, but uh, re re reproductivity, um, uh, we see changes in a population and characteristics of a population. Some things get weeded out, some things get accentuated, some things remain consistent. That's what they're calling evolution. And this isn't a new idea, and it sure as hell didn't start with Darwin. Darwin is just the guy that got sort of famous for explaining it fairly well. And, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, and that's another thing you don't want to necessarily fall into a, 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 the trap of, is, is arguing about Darwin. Um, Darwin was a long, long time ago, and um, we have... Uh, he wasn't right in a, in a handful of cases, um, or at least not, again, going back to the nature of science conversation. It's not that he wasn't right, but that he, you know, there's aspects where he's wrong. <laughs> um, and so when folks come up and start arguing about Darwin, we're like, yeah, we, we know he was wrong. Not necessarily what, you know, you, you guys are arguing back at, at about, but um, Darwin isn't where evolution stopped. Okay, the, pardon the pun, the conversation kept evolving. All right, it is science after all. Uh, and it's been going on for 2,000 and some years. Aristotle just for happens to be the, the, the first maybe guy to get published about it. Uh, but certainly that came from conversations that came from conversations. Um, this isn't new. So continuous unidirectional change, one direction. Um, there was a famous band a long time ago called Devo. And uh, some people know, like, one of their songs, Whip It. Um, but that was short for de-evolution, yeah. all right? And uh, the idea was that society was regressing as a whole, uh, deconstructing, they were deconstructing this, and so on and so oh, forth. It, sorry? De -evolution. Yes, 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 to de-evolve, to unevolve. Um, but... Uh, so de-evolution is negative for evolution is positive. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know that that always works as a as a prefix. I'm thinking of development, but uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So in don't. This case, it be negative. Yeah, yeah, but not like the a prefix, which is always negative. But anywho, um, so continuous unidirectional change. In other words, always moving forward. Now, mind you, forward isn't always, you know positive or for the best, but just it's, all they're saying is this is kind of goes in one, one, one way. Um, there's two kinds of evolution you could talk about right off the bat, and then we're actually going to split one of these into two kinds of evolution, so sometimes you guys get a little confused there. Um, two branches, and one is organic, and the other is uh, physical, or phys is physical. Um, physical evolution we do talk about in here quite a bit. In my other classes, we try to tend to stick on the biological part. Um, physical evolution would be talking about things like uh, plate tectonics, large scale. The continents have moved over time. You learn about Pangaea, uh, Laurentia, and Gondwana, and then the continents that we have today. Um, there was there was a time before Pangaea. Um, when Pangaea actually came together, and before that it, it split up. You guys don't hear about that one so much. And nobody really has that many problems with uh, plate tectonics that, that I'm aware of it's at any rate. Yeah. yeah. It's, if, I know. Uh, I thank you. Um, so, and then also, more so in here, we talk about physical evolution uh, as environments change. Um, and this is something once you guys are around a little longer, or maybe you've happened to have been near an environment that changed in your lifetime. Um, lakes and swamps dry up. Marshes dry up. They turn into fields. Fields uh, can swamp out. They can Something can happen nearby, and they start getting a lot more water than they did. 
and they turn into a, a marsh and, and it happens and fields grow in as trees. Um, their seeds fly into the field and there's lots of room to grow, plenty of sunlight. Fields uh, change into to forests and so on and so forth and forests die. We aren't usually around long enough to see stuff like that happen, but it's certainly, we understand that it could happen, we know that it could happen, and um, we will talk about it happening in here. Uh, the biological evolution is, is usually, again, what, what most people hear about, and um, that is the one that folks tend to get all bent out of shape about as well. As you'll find out in a moment, though, it's really only um, one of the kinds of biological evolution that, that people are upset about. So another way to look at or of uh, evolution is origin of or change of groups of organisms through time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, and then origin of or changes in environments over time. All right, so again, just trying to make that connection there that we're talking about critters and plants in, in, um, in the biological, and then the environment as a whole, which brings in weather, plants, critters, obviously everything, all right, um, over time as well. And I'm not going to argue that usually it's weather that's the predominant effector of that, but it pretty much is, in my opinion. Yeah. Would you believe that the biggest um, effects for like physical change would be like icebergs and phenomena? Um, would they? What would they be? Like icebergs that go off onto lands where they make their way and then um, pass. Okay, is that one of the biggest effectors? No. Um, do do glaciers have? an effect on, yes, definitely, it's depending on where you live, especially where we are, um, they definitely are responsible for a lot of our landscape. And uh, when we went, you know, you go into or out of an ice age, you, you know, that's definitely an environment changer. Um, but, uh, but yeah, and I think we get a little bit of time to talk about that towards the end of the semester. Um, but, yeah, that is, that is certainly an effector. Definitely. And that would be mostly physiological, physical, but also it could be the biological as well, to some extent, because, again, the environment's change that affects the organisms. So back to uh, biological or organic evolution here for a little bit. Um, actually, I think for the rest of the lecture. There, as I mentioned, there are two types of organic evolution. So there's two types of evolution, organic and the physical. And then two types of organic evolution, and microevolution versus macroevolution. And I was actually just having this conversation um, the other day, strangely, with so not in class. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to change the slide here because these words will show up again. All right, so microevolution, <coughs> excuse me, is those uh, changes in gene frequency that we were just talking about a couple minutes ago. Okay. Um, it tends to happen within a single population, and it tends to happen within a short period of time. Now, that is the new part of um, what Darwin said. All right, again, we, you know, he said a bunch, a whole bunch of stuff a long time ago, and we continue to study evolution since then. I don't remember if I have a slide on it or not, but more or less the current. Um, conversations around evolution uh, focus on something called punctuated equilibrium. And um, it, it tells us that we have long periods of, of stasis, long periods of nothing really changing. And then we have a very short, the punctuated part, a very short burst of, of change. All right. Um, and that's actually supported in the fossil record. That was part of the problem with Darwin, is that a lot of what he said we didn't have evidence for, and we spent you know, a hundred and some years looking for uh, his evidence. Missing link, you've heard of that, right? His his description necessitates missing links. And um, we really just weren't finding them. We we're finding transitions, sure. But, um, and, and punctuated equ equilibrium actually explains why you won't find missing links. It's, it's kind of cool stuff. 
Again, I don't think we'll end up getting into it too deep. We'll see where the slides lead us, though. So microevolution is that gene pool stuff. Um, it usually happens in a single population and then uh, in a relatively short period of time. Macroevolution is the descent of different species from a common ancestor. This is the one that freaks people out. So okay. like how human beings originally came from apes. Sorry? So like how human beings originally came from apes. Uh, more or less. Yeah, the hominid line of structure there. Chim chimpanzees, yeah, yeah, that's right. technically. But yeah. Um, and even that, again, is sort of Elmo on Sesame Street talking about it. It's, it's <laughs> a, you know, it is overly simplified. Um, and this one, you know, and I, and I haven't had an opportunity in a long time, but uh, we had a class, Historical Geology, and we would focus on this for a good part. I mostly did vertebrates because they're the easiest to discuss, but um, we would talk about how um, vertebrates, we're vertebrates, everything with bones is a vertebrate, essentially. We went from fishes to amphibians to reptiles to mammals to birds. Um, sorry? Yes, yes. Um, and we, we show and we talk about changes in there. That's macroevolution, okay? And, and the reason I say that, you know, folks don't really have a problem with micro is, uh, for one thing, it's, it's really easy to see and kind of hard to argue against. Um, and, and the other reason, especially nowadays, whether you believe in vaccines or not, which is a ridiculous thing to say, but w w whether or not you believe in vaccines, um, you're not going to want to go to the doctors and get a vaccine from five years ago for the flu. Why not? What changes? Yeah, the virus, the flu, the thing that gives you the flu. All right, uh, you know, that's microevolution right there. The flu changes. We all acknowledge that. Um, everyone acknowledges that. Whether you like vi uh, vaccines or not, everyone says, oh, yeah, you know, it's a different flu. I get that. It, 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 it changes. Well, that's evolution. That's all we're talking about. Um, what we can talk about, though, is that it can change a population from, and again, I'm... I'm Elmoing things, but it can change a population so that you have a lot more uh, blonde-haired and blue-eyed people versus brown-haired and brown-eyed people. Um, you could change a population where they slowly get taller, uh, and, and so on and so forth. That, that's also an extension of that. Um, and again, that doesn't tend to bother people so much. It's just that one small aspect. Yeah, question. Then we're going to move on. Go ahead. I, I have a great example. It's like when someone, you see a river, you step inside it, the river is different, and if you step your other foot inside, it's still different, and it changes again. So it's like that example. What, the river? Okay, there's an example where if one per, if a person sees a river and then steps inside it, the river is completely different. And then if they do it again, it changes again because of how... <coughs> Okay, well, yeah, yeah, that's that's not untrue. I'm not sure how relative that is, but that is that's that's true. All right. So, so micro and macro, um, just okay. We're just we're we're changing gears now. So we decided we differentiated that there's a couple different ways to think about evolution, and within those, there's a couple ways to think about that as well. Uh, we're going to go back and look at some of the historical evolutionary thinkers. Uh, Buffon, uh, it's not Buffoon, Buffon. Uh, I think French. Lamarck, no, I Dar Darwin, and then Gould and Eldridge. So apparently I do go to punctuated equilibrium a bit. Oh, Mark, what would be? Patience. Patience. All right. So uh, Buffon here, 1707 to 1788 is when he did his thing, uh, when he lived, I should say. Um, so all forms of life have evolved from other forms. Uh, the environment plays an important role in an organism's development and its existence. Uh, changes in an organism due to inheritance of characteristics from parents and establish the idea of species. 
Now, um, I don't know why I don't have uh, Mendel in here and his pea plants, um, because I'm finding myself wondering when he did his thing, and I'm sure it wasn't the 16s. Uh, it probably was the 17s, but I could be wrong. When was Gregor Mendel alive? Yeah, he was mid-18s. Okay. So, yeah, he was way later. So, um, this guy was, and I would definitely say, an early thinker in this area, uh, the inheritance of, of characteristics. Now, here's the thing. Even when you jump to Gregor Mendel, they didn't know about genes. All right. Um, he was really figuring out that, you know, they, you, could, you could pass on these traits, but they didn't have a, a mechanism by any means. Um, so they're, they're coming up with these ideas. It's hard to erase our collective knowledge base right now. It's hard to go back and imagine that there was a time when people didn't know about this, that, or the other thing. Um, and we want to think, well, how can they not know that? They're sort of, well, no, they, they just, the technology wasn't there for the main thing. There, there's so many aspects. Um, so these were really, you know, revolutionary thoughts at the time. Um, and the idea of a species we attribute to him uh, is is great as well, that there is a unique, um, specific, remember I always try to use the word specific when we talk about species, um, organism, all right? And uh, Linnaeus certainly worked with this idea as, as well. Um, he based, you know, the Linnaean structure, uh, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, you know. Um, that idea was 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 certainly worked in hand in hand with this. Also, he brings in the environment. Okay, an organism does not exist outside of its environment. Uh, the environment plays an important role in uh, not just in an organism existing there, but uh, how it uh, how it exists. So, so uh, Buffon there with a lot of important stuff. So Lamarck, Lamarck is the giraffe guy, as most of you guys know him. Um, <coughs> there's some, sorry, I coughed, what? Are you French? I, I think so, Jean-Baptiste, yeah, yeah, quite possibly. Um, so uh, he, he, he gets known as the giraffe guy, unfortunately for him, because he was actually a really smart guy and uh, did a lot of work, bless you, uh, in, the, in the field. Um, it's not on here, but I think he also um, did a lot of work with uh, invertebrates. Um, a lot of work. So are it's along the wait, invertebrates are um, bugs, uh, worms, things without a skeleton. Yeah. yeah they don't have um, sea seashells, seashell critters, stuff like that. So um, in, in addition to terming the coin biology. Uh, he, he did a handful of things, but it was sort of based on the idea that this is an actually a, a fairly smart guy, that at some point they went back and sort of reevaluated all that stuff he said about the giraffes, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. And um, there's a growing number of people that kind of think that maybe he was sort of mistranslated, not just misunderstood, but mistranslated. He did write, I, I believe, in French instead of in, in Latin. Um, and I don't want to say that, you know, we didn't know a whole lot about French at the time. That's that's not the right way to say it. But uh, phrasing and, and stuff like that, I, I think can get can get kind of bent out of bent out of shape. And again, especially in light of all his other work. Um, so right here, altered behavior leads to greater or lesser use of a given structure causing it to increase or decrease in size over generations. That's just not right. Um, well, the way it's worded isn't right. And again, that goes back to the point. Um, this here, change in environment causes changes in an organism's behavior. That's obvious. Uh, we see that even in our lives. Uh, when our environment changes, we have to make changes ourselves, uh, but out in the wild, of course, is where we're talking about. Um, and then disuse would eventually cause the structure to shrink or even disappear. 
and all such changes were inheritable. Um, the, the problem comes in, I think, with, with scale, time scale. Um, the way it was presented, or at least the way his work was presented, I don't know if he died early, and I don't know what the details of it, unfortunately, but I don't know why so many people were left de defining his work and he wasn't really able to defend his work. Um, but the idea that the, uh, the environment changed and these giraffes gradually had to uh, stretch their necks further and further uh, in order to reach the higher and higher branches because, oh, I don't know, a whole bunch of things moved in that ate the lower branches maybe or something happened to the trees. Who knows what happened to the trees? But that was the story at any rate. And here's the hard part then, that of course those, those changes were passed on to their offspring. Well, again, that's kind of like saying that uh, you and your spouse decide all of a sudden to start working out and going to the gym every day, five days a week, and then you have a child and that child is like comes out totally buff. No, it, you know, it doesn't work that way. And, and, and we realize that we think it's, you know, funny. It is funny. But that's how it was interpreted, that these giraffes will then be born with slightly longer necks. Now, of course, we know what actually happened was that the giraffes that had longer necks were able to eat the higher leaves and therefore lived to reproduce. And then because of Punnett Square that you know, they passed on those characteristics of having longer necks to their offspring, and eventually we see a population shift towards a longer neck. That's how it really worked. But at the time, again, and we used to think, you know, believe in spontaneous generation and leeches and stuff like that, too. So, you know, we, we, we do look back and wonder sometimes. But that's still, like I said, there's a decent amount of people out there that, that think Lamarck kind of got a raw deal. Um. <clears throat> you know, the important part is, is that his ideas highlighted a continual, gradual change in organisms as they adapt to their uh, environment. Now, I know, I know I just said that, uh, you know, we, we kind of left that Darwinian view and, and moved on to this rapid changes off to the side. Um, but this is... Nonetheless, it, it's a matter of scale. It's a matter of scale. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I, well, I can start from this by saying, like, they adopt an environment with no change. And they, like, they adopt with the present, but, and they don't adopt, they, they die out. Like, like I would call <coughs> it with a new kind. Well, yeah, but the key there is, is adapting. And, and the way we use the word adapt, um, again, we're out of the system as humans, I'm going to say again. Because the way we adapt is we build things. We build an air conditioner. We build a, a heater. Um, when we talk about adapt in this sense, it isn't. It's. It isn't. That isn't what they mean at all. Um, you have to have that characteristic, that helpful characteristic, already existing. Um, the, we talk about the species adapting. We're not talking about the individual adapting. All right. And that's a, that's a, it's a huge issue. Um, one of the biggest issues we have to overcome when we're talking about this is the way we use the word adapt. Um, because we're so used to thinking of it, again, on an individual level. As a, um, but it, it has to, that characteristic has to be in there uh, already. And then the species or the population can adapt. Not all of them, as you said, some that, that don't have that ability will will not reproduce, not necessarily die because of the problem. Sometimes they do, but they will at least not reproduce to pass on the unhelpful trait. So. Wait, if a species doesn't reproduce, won't they die out? Like, yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. But within the species, um, within the population, um, not everyone has the same character. Just look around the room. Uh, within our population, there's, there's a variety of different characteristics here. All right, and if we were in a position where it actually came down to, um, you know, out there in the woods surviving kind of thing, some of us would obviously um, do better than others. Okay, um, I can't climb a tree. So I weigh 300 pounds. I'm going to get eaten by a tiger. You know, it just it is. So, um, huh? Tigers aren't a sport, but more like bear, you know. Regardless. 
you get my point. So, all right. But, um, so yeah, that, that kind of stuff. But, um, yeah. So, all right. So, Darwin, um, Origin of the Species. Everyone knows that name. There's actually more to the title uh, by means of natural selection. Okay, 1859. Uh, populations evolve over generations through a process of natural selection. All right. Natural selection. Um, and then the words descent with modification kind of get thrown along in there as well. And all of this does sort of feed into what we're, we're seeing out of Lamarck. Uh, what was the date on Lamarck here? So into the early 18th. So Darwin would have been reading Lamarck's stuff. Yeah. All right. Um, and again, he saw himself in, improving on it. And he did. Again, it's, it's all it's steps along the way. Um, it's not that Darwin was wrong in any given thing, but it's just there were some aspects where he wasn't quite right. Um, if he did nothing else, he, he popularized the idea, made it widespread uh, knowledge that life uh, has evolved. And again, any farmer, anyone who wasn't just isolated in an apartment in a city already you know, would know, yes, my, my livestock, my plants have changed while I've been growing them. They, you could see that. All right, He just gave it a vocabulary, a, a, an idea. Um, if you actually were able to read at this point, which wasn't everybody, um, you could read about how he put that idea out there. All right, the mechanism, which the mechanism is called natural selection. So um, it's means of evolving through natural selection, and the idea obviously being that nature selects who gets to move on. That's where survival of the fittest came from. I don't believe that was his wording ever. That was somebody paraphrasing and thinking, oh, this is what I think he means, and that caught on too. So, natural selection, the process in which better adapted individuals are more likely to survive and reproduce. And we've talked about that several times already this morning. Yeah. <laughs> all right, which then, the effect of that, uh, differential reproduction, all right, you're going to see that word in a couple minutes, um, basically leads to a uh, representative portion of, of the population. What I'm saying there is, is what we were just talking about. This is just a little wordier. Um, those traits will be passed on more so than the other traits. We'll call them more desirable than least desirable. All right, who's desiring them or what's desiring them is, is besides the point right now. For the situation, for the environment, all right, those traits are more favorable than others. Uh, or some traits are more favorable than others. Some are neutral and they can stay in. Uh, obviously, the detrimental ones do get weeded out, okay? Uh, usually rather quickly. Um, we've done tons of, of research in this field. And um, where I went to uh, grad school at, they had a, uh, a lab that was studying this. And um, they were doing it in the fruit fly. And I'm like, oh my god, why would you work you know, with fruit flies? They're so small, they're pain in the butt to take care of, blah, 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 blah. And, and not that we're not looking at genes in the first place. Nobody's genes are any bigger than anybody else's genes, right? Um, so it really doesn't matter the size of the organism, but I was, you know, 20 something and dumb. Um, but I missed the obvious thing is that fruit flies cycle their generations so quickly. Fruit flies live for a couple days. So then the next generation, then the next generation, then the next generation. You could watch these evolutionary changes. They weren't, you know, changing things that we would normally think about, but they were changing various aspects of these little flies. And then we could watch the shifts in months to a year instead of, you know, decades. So, um, you know, when you see, if you read about these, these uh, studies in uh, genes and whatnot, there's a reason they use the critters that they do quite frequently. Um, so, anywho. So adaptation, okay? And again, I, I use this word very lightly. We have to use it because all the books use it. Um, it's not adapting like we normally think of the word adapting. What do we got here? We got evolutionary modifications of an individual that improves the individual's chances of survival and reproductive success. Even that 
lead you to think that this was a cognitive decision, okay? The critter saying, oh, I'm going to start doing this, and I'm going to live because of it. You know, that's not what, so, you guys got a game or? Okay. Going to the same meeting. Um, it's not a conscious decision, all right? Uh, in fact, it's it's probably not even acknowledged at the time, other than, um, you know, I'm just doing the best that I can. And, um, you know, you might notice, of course, the other members of your population are dying. Um, but uh, you probably don't understand why. I don't know. It's tough to think what animals think, let alone plants, right? Um, so the better adapted um, is those with genetic traits that allow them to be better suited to the environment. That right there, that's, it's, it's almost a pre-adaptation, and that's, that's really hard to think about. Because um, even though it's not like a Boy Scouts, be prepared kind of thing. It, it's just you have the potential in you already in that circumstance to be able to survive when perhaps the person or object next to you does not. Yeah. So, and then again, this is what I'm talking about. It's predetermined versus how we usually, you know, decide to go MacGyver on something and make a contraption to help. That's not what we're talking about. So natural selection is a gradual process by which biological traits uh, other become either more or less common in a population. I think we've talked about that. Uh, a function of the effect of inherited traits on the differential reproductive success of organisms interacting with their environment. Boy, that's a wordful, a mouthful. Um, so what do we got here? A function of the effect of an inherited traits on the differential reproductive status, success. Okay. So again, we talked about this as well already. Um, it's easy to think about this, again, in, in humanistic terms. Um, that is a a, a a a desirable organism with features and traits that make its mate uh, think that it's desirable and and such and such in in humans whatever aspects we may find um, attractive in other humans in squirrels in birds okay. Uh, we hear so many things about, well, the male birds are more colorful than the female birds, and so they can attract a mate. And, and you know, we hear this stuff all the time. It's those subtle details in there. Uh, what is it about that, that bird that makes him, um, you know, what aspect of the more colors makes the female bird say, oh, I, I want to have eggs with him? You know, that you, you, we don't necessarily know. In humans, it's easy to think about, perhaps. Again, not everybody looks for the same traits in, in everybody, but there's a handful of, you know, you want a mate that's that is um, has some has some drive, some motivation in them, um, so that you know that you guys are going to um, have a, 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 a you're not going to struggle later in life, and and so on and so forth. It's hard to talk about the human aspects of things because of the socioeconomic stuff. But you, you get the idea. All right, we have favorable things. Um, and um, those people that display them, arguably, again, not necessarily reflected in humans, but those people tend to reproduce more than those without the desirable traits. Um, we will see at some points that it is oftentimes not even physiological. Uh, characteristics. We can see things like um, uh, whether you're active during the day or active during the night, uh, where you uh, choose to live in an environment. All right, can actually. Sure, you could also just hit mute. But um, so um, there's lots of things. But again, it's easiest to talk about uh, the physiological stuff that we could see and we kind of can relate to. So these um, desirable, inheritable traits then concentrate through the generations, okay, as we go through in that, again, in that gene pool. I'm using the word gene pool. I hope you all know at least roughly what a, a gene pool is, okay? It's, it's the sum of all the potential in a population, all right? All the different characteristics 
brown hair, blonde hair, black hair, long, uh, not long hair, straight hair, curly, eyes, fair, curly hair, blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, okay, eyes. Um, you know, whatever. All those things are floating around in this, this gene pool that we have. So again, natural selection is the mechanism, all right? And um, where we get to then with this nature, again, what we're really talking about is the environment, okay? Mother nature is the environment. And um, so it's these, these environmental factors. So what are we talking about? We've got uh, food supply or, or the types of food that are available, uh, living space, climate. All right, again, all things we've talked about earlier in this chapter and in the previous chapter as well. All right, so uh, we are going to talk about each of these on, on a little more detail in the next couple slides, so I'm going to kind of blow through them real quick here, but you will see them again. So for natural selection to work, you need four things. Uh, high reproductive capacity. Again, we'll explain what that means in a minute. Uh, inheritable variation. Limits on population growth. And differential reproduction. All right. And I think by the time we're done talking about this, you guys will agree that we do have all four of those. Um, and if that's the case, then natural selection should work. All right. High reproductive capacity. Um, you may know this word as attrition. Again, especially if you've farm-based, farm-related. Um, not all the critters make it, unfortunately. It sucks. It's horrible. Um, again, we, we, we humanize, anthropomorphize everything, and we like cute, fuzzy things. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, but not everything survives. All right? Um, and because of that, and again, this evolved at some point too, we must assume, um, each species is capable of producing more offspring uh, than will survive. All right, so that's what high reproductive capacity means. Inheritable variation. Um, individuals within a population show variation. I think we could agree to that. And those variations, or well, let's, you know, God forbid we use a, a scientific word here, traits, uh, those traits are passed on if the organism lives to produce. Those, organisms, those traits can be passed on, have the potential to be passed on. Because again, think back to your Punnett square, sometimes stuff gets lost, right? But we understand that these traits can get passed on. Limits on population growth. Well, that's all about resources, okay? Whether it's food, somewhere to live, energy in the system just as a whole. There are limits. There's other limits that are uh, external, for lack of a better word. All right? Uh, predators, diseases. Call it chaos, if you will, with disease at any rate. And again, because of said limits, not all organisms will survive to reproduce. One could assume, we don't like to assume in science, but one can fairly safely assume that those organisms that do survive to reproduce um, did so uh, because they had the best combination of traits for the environment at that time. That's also a key word there, at that time, because environments change. So what is favorable now may not be favorable in 25 years or 50 years. That's true, yeah. um, Australia, did you say? Sure. Or that's true, yeah. I said that's true. Okay. <laughs> Australia. All right. And, and I think this is kind of where that whole survival of the fittest thing came from. Okay. Um, so... Uh, differential reproductive success. All right, individuals with favorable characteristics will survive and reproduce uh, and will pass on those characteristics to their young. 
and um, and then those uh, offspring that possess the characteristics uh, that they inherited from their parents, if they did uh, catch them, um, they will potentially be able to outcompete their colleagues, their peers, if you would, and, and so on and so forth. And over time, you should you should see a shift towards those favorable characteristics um, and, and not of the others. Now, again, not everything is detrimental. Not everything is harmful. There are some sort of eh, neutrally kind of stuff. And those can stay in a lot longer than, than others, all right? Um, but uh, we do tend to see the bad stuff um, filter out. So again, as long as all of those are uh, in order, uh, as long as all of those are happening and, and true, for lack of a better word, I hate to say true in science, but um, natural selection works until the environment changes. Okay, Again, this is an environmental science class. Everything comes back to the environment is, is control, controlled of everything. And physical evolution we will get to, but another day. So today is about the biological and how, um, how that all happens. All right, evidence for evolution. We got five um, lines of evidence. And again, these will each be explained in their own slide or two. Uh, branching organization of life, a, uh, homo the existence of homologous structures, the existence of vestigial structures, uh, something called ontogeny, and something called ecological convergence. So uh, we're going to illustrate how these five um, aspects, uh, these five things, um, help support the idea that uh, what we're showing is going on. So the branching organism of life, um, organization of life, not organism, branching organization of life. Uh, again, this is best to think of as, uh, I know not everyone has file cabinets anymore, but you're familiar with file cabinets. And at the very least, you uh, probably keep files on your computer or in your cloud, right? And uh, you have folders. You might have a folder uh, for this semester, and in this uh, semester's folders, you might have a folder for a couple of your classes, okay? Uh, and then come uh, spring semester, come the end of the, the year, uh, you might drag your fall folder and your spring folder and throw that into a 23-24 school year folder, just as an example. We do the same thing with taxes or you know whatever you you do we do tend to organize things in life most of us are um, are organizers there's some sloppy people out there I'm certainly one of them too uh, but mainly it's because I don't have the uh, the time to keep things organized uh, but when given the time I will put things in their proper order so ways back we came up with a uh, neat way and this is actually over over many years and many people um, this this idea and this is you know attributed to to Linnaeus of course um, but this Linnaean structure of uh, kingdom phylum class order family with genus, <coughs> species species being the smallest folder and uh, kingdom being the largest folder all right we got uh, animals we got plants we got your couple bacteria nowadays used to just be bacteria but now we got um, Archaebacteria and uh, eubacteria, I think. We've got the fungi, and then uh, protistas, I think, show up as well. And the idea, oh, and plant, did I say plants? Hopefully that's a plant yes. there. All right, so the idea being that everything that exists out there, or everything that ever has existed, and presumably everything that will come to exist, uh, can fit into those kingdoms. Well, that's pretty dang broad. Those are some big folders. Those are file cabinets on their own. So somebody said, okay, well, that's, that's too huge. Let's take <coughs> those ideas of kingdoms and let's break it down a little more. Within animals, not everything is the same. Um, 
we see first and foremost not everything has bones okay let's throw them into a folder all right everything else here has bones let's put them into a folder um, and and so on and so forth okay and that works its way down all the way to the most specific things and again just like the way you organize things at home uh, you may have everything just thrown into one big folder maybe um, or you can have little folders for you know the months here's all my bills from January here's all my bills from February and, and, and so on and so forth that's pretty you know that's bordering on OCD but you get, you get my point you could and that's sort of just the idea that's going on on here and how we've done this over the years has changed we used to just group things into you know it flies it swims it walks on land well we found out that that swimming is a little too vague because so we've got the land. Anyway, they go well land. yeah yeah I just picked one of them um, the swimming was was too vague because well things that swim we've got fishes um, we've got octopuses and we've got um, uh, dolphins, all right? And right there, we've just picked three different groups. So over time, and flying is another one. We've got birds, we've got bats, we've got bugs, right? Those are incredibly different. So, and walking, I think, as you said, you know, that, that, that's actually less varied of, of the others, but, um, Pretty much, we've got eh, amphibians, reptiles, mammals. Yeah, they're all equally wrong. <laughs> so we realized over time that we had to reorganize things. All right, and that's still going on now. This hasn't changed. Or I'm sorry, this hasn't stayed the same. Um, there's folks now who are going back through and not exactly throwing Linnaeus away, but um, saying, "Hey, now that we have the ability to look at genetics." Let's do that. That's the kind of work that led to dinosaurs are birds. I'm sorry, or birds are, are dinosaurs. Well, um, is that one dinosaurs that fly? Um, dinosaurs don't fly. There are some winged reptiles. There's like pterosaur and uh, pterodactyl, those yeah, kind of guys. Exactly, yeah. yeah, they're not dinosaurs, though. Uh, they show up in that little plastic baggie of dinosaurs. But, um, so that's just a misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah for the most I mean, it, it works, but... Yeah, you know, technically they are they are branched off somewhere, but um, so at any rate, they're still working, and now they're looking at genetics, and they're saying, okay, these things are a lot closer. Uh, we mentioned uh, apes or in chimpanzees the other day, uh, a little while ago. <clears throat> it's that kind of research that says, okay, you guys have uh, this number of chromosomal pairs in common uh, with this organism. And everyone's all, you know, mortified with the chimpanzee thing because I think it's we there's a two chromosomal pair difference between us and chimpanzees. And you look and say, oh my God, that's you know such huge differences attributed to just two chromosomal pair that doesn't seem possible. Um, but those same articles, if you go on to read them, will show you that you've got like 60% uh, of the same stuff that a, um, uh, a coral has. All right, and we're arguably quite different than coral. So that's, that chromosomal pair stuff, I think, was kind of just thrown out there to shock people, for lack of a better word. Um, chromosomes are amazing things. Genetics is, is amazing. Um, but uh, we need to be careful the way we, we interpret it, I, I think. So anyhow, that's branching organization of life. Uh, homologous structures, or homologous, as you guys sometimes say. All right, homologous. Uh, similar underlying structures of bones, muscles, and nerves manifest themselves as different external structures and or functions between related organisms. And that's because these similarities were derived from a common ancestor And these things that we're talking about are homologous elements. Now, that's a bunch of weird, scary words right there. But actually, you know about some of these already. I'll show you in a moment. If you have a dog or a cat at home, you've undoubtedly, you know, poked at their paws and petted their legs while you're petting, you know, the rest of their body. And you, you realize, hey, you know, these arm bones and these leg bones feel very similar to mine. All right, they're... 
palms of their hands, their, their, their toes feel rather similar to mine. You've noticed this stuff. We're just giving you some vocabulary words for it. And of course, it extends beyond just your critters at home. All right. It goes out into the rest of the world. Uh, a bat's wing, okay, is uh, basically the <coughs> extension of um, some finger bones. All right. A, uh, the bones inside of, of the flipper of a dolphin. Again, they're the hand bones. Uh, the horses, all right, uh, which is the part I, I worked with when I was in school. Um, they're basically the an extension of the, the middle finger uh, bone. This digit here, they've reduced all these others over the years. Um, and we see that reduction even with the, uh, the cats and the dogs. Oh, where'd it go? Lost my mouse. There it is. Uh, what we sometimes call the, the dew claw, you know, up higher. Um, so we've all got the same bones. Hands are, and feet are tough. There's so many bones in hands and feet. I hate working with hands and feet. It's really easy to see if you stay in the appendage, okay? You, you can look at our arm bones and our leg bones. Um, those are hardly modified at all. And at this level, they're great things to, to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, everyone's femur looks the same. Everyone's radius and ulna and uh, tibia and fibia. You know, whether you're on all fours or on twos, there's, there's more modifications in the shoulder and the hips uh, than there are in, in the those bones. So, again, there's still changes. You know, knees work depending on the critter. Knees work in different directions and, and ankles the same way. So it gets weird after that, but uh, it's really easy to see. Um, and ribs and backbones, very, very similar. But I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, so that, you know, to me it makes perfect sense. Might not be as clear to you guys, but I'm telling you, look, it is, it is simple. Go get a rotisserie chicken, take it apart, look at it. Okay, uh, while we're here, we need to stop and talk about analogous functions, analogous elements. And these are structures that have the same function, but not the same origin. And this is where we get the birds, bats, and gnats conversation. All right. Um, insects, birds, and mammals. So again, out exterior, same structure. Interior, different wiring, if you would. For starters, insects, no bones at all. But really awesome wings, no doubt. Um, he mentioned earlier the, uh, the pterodons, pterodactyl. Yeah. All right. Um, what we see here, this color coding tends to show you where the um, similar bone structure is. All right. Uh, we already explained to you that, like in a bat, for example, the uh, fingers uh, are responsible for the, the majority of the structure of the wing. And you actually see the uh, hind leg here in the picture. Um, well, your bird does have a, uh, a radius and an ulna and a, and a, and a humerus here. Um, the, the wing structure itself, we don't see um, the, the digits playing much into the effect at all. Uh, this one isn't arguably that different, but um, enough so. We go back to the reptiles, and again, we see your, your humerus, your radius, and your ulna here, and we've got one single digit going all the way back through here. All right. Um, as composed to just a, a variety of them here. So um, different, different setups but they arrived at the same outcome. And, you know, that's a great conversation in and of itself. How did you get to the same outcome with, with different ways? And you always know there's, there's multiple ways to, to skin a cat, as they say. There's multiple ways to get the same result with different methods. So just, again, analogous structures that perform the same function, but not derived from similar evolutionary origins.
And yeah, I agree. These arguably don't look that different, but um, for the folks in charge, yeah, they have their important differences that I'm sure I'm not highlighting enough. Vestigial structures. Um, at first glance, this kind of seems to support uh, Lamarck, right? Uh, and, and I agree with you. If you're thinking, you know, you're processing that deep, and you may not arrive at that thought until, you know, you're home later studying this stuff. Um, but again, it was the, the delivery, and, and, and I've argued that Lamarck wasn't that off anyhow. But uh, vestigial structures you probably know best as your uh, appendix, okay? Um, there's other uh, things, your tailbone. Physiologically, your tailbone serves no purpose other than to hurt like hell when you land on it. And arguably, that's not a real good reason to have it. Um, it has, uh, you know, shrunk, for lack of a better word, over the years uh, down to the, the structure that we have now. It doesn't protect anything. Bones serve two functions. They serve three functions, uh, either to uh, protect, uh, support, or muscle attachment. Muscle attachment isn't too much different than support, but um, the tailbone does none of those. So, um, but the appendix is, an, is another great one. They they say that um, you know back back when we had a much rougher diet, um, that we needed this extra digestive space to. Um, help us digest the food longer, just kind of keep it in there so you get more nutrients out of it. Um, within, I say nowadays, within the last uh, probably 20 years or so, um, if you know about uh, like gut biotics and stuff like that, um, they've come to uh, realize in various studies that the appendix is where a lot of that uh, goes on. It's sort of the, the, the nursery for your gut bacteria, um, which is great because we need them to help us, you know, digest our food and so on and so forth. But that's also tends to be why, you know, if your appendix and anyone, you all still have your appendix? Anyone lose theirs yet? I kept mine until I was in my 30s. And uh, one day teaching, I started reaching to something on the board or something, and I just went to yelp. And every time I moved, I started yelping again and couldn't figure out what was wrong. Um, that gets clogged up, gets like a piece of randomness or some of that biotics for your stomach. It just gets clogged up and it festers. And that's when your appendix, mine didn't explode. Luckily, they, we got it out before it did. Um, but uh, rupture is the word they use. But, um, but that's how that gets infected. And then they found in people after that, you know, that they do have some uh, trouble with the, with the gut bacteria. So... Um, whether it was there for that reason all along, you know, that's a tough one to say. But, but at any rate, an appendix is usually uh, given as one of the great examples for vestigial structures. Um, a vestigial structure, if you haven't yet read the slide there, it's, it's stuff that we feel we used to use uh, that we no longer use. Uh, whales and snakes have hip bones. Why else would you have a hip bone if you didn't have legs at some point? I guess you could argue planning ahead, maybe, but um, that seems wasteful. Since you have to grow and calcify your bones yourselves, that would be, you know, energy wasted for planning ahead. Um, but, uh, but yeah, whales, uh, mammals evolved on land. They did move to the water, um, and uh, snakes... Reptiles, you know, originally had four appendages. Um, snakes lost those. Uh, I'm not sure if they still have a collarbone, though, but uh, there are a handful of snakes that they, they can see the hip bone in. I forget which. Some branches of them. Uh, and then the remnant toes along uh, horses. Um, as we mentioned already, horses show as a reduction. And we've even got horses. This was a huge uh, paleontological flub. Uh, over the years, they used to line up all these horses in uh, order of reducing toes. 
and argue that it was this argument for you know evolution over time and um, again the geneticists come in and say well no actually these guys are over here these guys are over here they, they, nothing to do with one another um, but the modern horse that we know and love again it has the re is re reduced digits down to just the uh, the center one You can take all that stuff for what you want. This one here is really the huge make it or break it point in my mind. Uh, what we call ontogeny. And ontogeny is um, what happens to you before you're born, essentially. You hopefully know that when you're inside your, your mom, um, you're living in an aquatic environment. And you've probably heard about umbilical cords. And you know that that's how you get your nutrients and all that stuff. We're, they don't like to use the word. We're essentially undergoing our, our larval stage inside of our uh, parent, our mother. Um, in that time period, you also have um, gills. All right. Because, again, you're in, a, in an aquatic environment. Um, you still need to uh, carry on the processes you're living. You need to carry on the processes of oxygen exchange, carbon dioxide removal, so on and so forth. Um, additionally, uh, we have tails. We've had you know, the opportunity to look at, uh, unfortunately, um, these, many of these um, organisms in there uh, before they were born. All right, And we, we see these steps along the way. Um, Every so often, you don't see National Enquirer and the Star and stuff like that at the grocery stores anymore. But growing up, they were always, always there. And if they weren't talking about politics, they were talking about weirdos who were born with too much hair or with tails or people that could see into the future and, and this, that, and the other thing. Um, and every so often, somebody is, I shouldn't use the word weirdo, but um, every so often, somebody is born you know, with a tail still on and just something glitched in the genetics that did not reduce uh, when it should have. And um, I don't know of anyone being born with gill slits, but uh, again, I'm sure, you know, it, it happened at some point. Um, <clears throat> so that argues just one line of things, that, that humans uh, certainly seem to share some... Um, <clears throat> developmental past with other organisms. And that would be fine on its own, uh, but it's even crazier when we look at the same thing in other organisms. Uh, we've got, <clears throat> excuse me, human on the far right here, uh, a rabbit, a chicken, a turtle, salamander, and a fish. So essentially we have um, a, a fish, a amphibian, a reptile, a bird, and a couple mammals, all right? And um, they're, they're, they go from, there's no months on here. Everyone has a different gestation period, so they didn't even attempt to, to do that. But the idea is that these are uh, equivalencies, right? And then we go down through here till the very end just before they're fully developed. But it's this middle stage here and the first stage where it's really uh, interesting how similar things look. And of course, this further you leave fish behind, fish were arguably the first vertebrates um, to go back to uh, that, that macro evolution conversation. Um, we went from fish to amphibians to reptiles to, and then it sort of split a couple ways here to, to birds and mammals um, off of reptiles modification. Um, but the common embryo embryonic um, origins, that's what ontogeny refers to. Okay. And uh, it's pretty surprising when you see it for the first time. All right. <clears throat> lastly, I think lastly, we've got ecological convergence. Sorry? Great. Great, great. 
Um, and this is pretty neat that we see that uh, again this under this this underlines the importance of the environment as one of the controlling factors. Uh, we see that that similar environments in different parts of the world tend to have the same organisms in them. Um, and yeah, you could go back and, and talk about Pangea and how plate tectonics and things like that, but we've got examples where these, these organisms came after that fact, for lack of a better word, or independent of that fact. Um, and that the environments tend to shape the same kinds of organisms. And that really shouldn't be surprising, I suppose, if, if you think about it in that, uh, going back to that word niche that we used, right? Um, if there are organisms and if environments have their own niches, certain environments have certain niches, and organisms are allowed to sort of choose their own niche, if you would, um, it would make sense that they would have organisms that fit those niches, that similar organisms would fit similar niches, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, so we, we see this um, a lot of ways. Uh, placental uh, mammals versus marsupial mammals um, is the best way to see it. Uh, I don't go into it right now for some reason. Usually I have a slide that goes right here that shows you, you know, the, um, you, you know, marsupials are the, the, the pouched animals. Uh, instead of uh, carrying the, uh, the uh, baby, I'll say baby for lack of a better word, uh, to full term, uh, it, it finishes its development. It crawls out of the, uh, the uterus and works its way up into the pouch and uh, finishes its developmental stage in the pouch, um, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Uh, it's a heck of a requirement to start life. Um, but uh, <clears throat> at any rate, um, these organisms are strikingly similar for every other aspect of their lives. So, uh, Sunnels versus marsupials is the usual go-to argument there. But again, there's, there's others. All right. Um, I've been talking an awfully long time. Yep. And this is... And this is um, the start of a new topic, so uh, we will leave this for, for Thursday.